And good morning. That special time of the morning where I say, how did everybody? I've already worked my way around the room. Those of you watching from home cannot see the room. And in that case, it's full of people. Okay. Uh, packed with exuberant uh, worshipers. Uh, and of course, most everybody knows I joke from time to time. Uh, those of us, I just like to say this because it really is neat. Those joining us from home. I see Ray and Vanessa and Michael and Janine. Um, I see Marsha, but she's also over there. Two places at once. That's pretty impressive. Uh, and it, it's silly. Uh, Dana just came online there. Uh, some of these people are actually in uh, Las Vegas and Alabama. And uh, uh, it's neat how I, I, said I didn't want to do the video thing early on. Corona kind of forced me. And it's been a blessing. It's been a blessing to see other people come online. The only thing I wanted to mention today uh, was uh, the shoe boxes. Let's start getting those things out uh, this week. They're all on the back table there. You want a shoe box and you want a pamphlet on how to fill the thing. This is an Operation uh, Christmas Child. This is the Franklin Grand Ministry. We did this last year. There's a plastic shoe box because we're using the higher upgrade one because this was a classy church. And inside, there's a list of those brochures on how and what to buy and fill for your shoebox. With that being said, let's begin with worship. God, let your glory go on and on. Impossible things in your name, they shall be done. Have a seat. I forgot it was my turn. Ambie's not here this. <laughs> so, um, good morning, church. It's good to see you. Um, Ambie and Adam are not here. Um, Adam's not well, so if you'll be praying for him, I know that they would greatly appreciate that. So, uh, Let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we love you, and you are so worthy to be praised. Um, with all the craziness going on in this world, in our nation, in our lives, we can become anxious. Um, however, I know that you tell us in your word, you are my servant, and I have chosen you and have not rejected you. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So we bring before you all that is on our hearts and all of our concerns, Father. For those who are sick, Lord, we ask you to heal. For those who've been displaced from their homes due to natural disasters, fire, and hurricanes, and the like, Lord, be with those. For those in our nation, uh, for, for our nation to return to you, Lord, to recognize you as the one true holy God. And for those in our world who need you desperately during to know of you, and to know all about you. Lord, we pray for that. Every care we lift to you right now, everything that is on our heart, Lord, we lift to you, God. And we thank you for your promises that you are with us and that we are not alone. Oh, God, do a work in our hearts, in our lives, Lord that we might be a reflection of Jesus Christ to others, that people would see you in us. And we thank you that uh, you are always with us and that we are not alone. In Jesus' name, amen. This is true, and we're desperate for your presence. All we need is you. Waiting.
Is that a seat? Come on, jump on in there. <clears throat> Working on uh, training on the new audio video system as I will be gone for the next two weeks and uh, Adam will be gone. There's a family wedding and Amber and Gwen. And so if something goes wrong, one of you guys is going to have to stand up and preach and someone else has to run the slides. And uh, You know, give me one more second. Would you hit the uh, number two on the white key fob next that one the white one the white one right there thank you i need to get that other one too i forgot it this morning <clears throat> let there be light so we had spent, actually spent a little bit of time here in the book of luke uh, todd spoke on chapter five last week i spoke on chapter six i wanted to bring one more story here from the book of luke uh, to your attention and it takes place in chapter 16 Luke chapter 16. Uh, and we'll just get right to it. Starting in verse 19. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. I got two verses there together. Well, I'll throw the other one in there too. Uh, yeah. At his gate uh, was laid a beggar named Lazarus covered with sores. You see it there on the screen. I should have separated those two. Because I want to spend a bit of time talking about the very first verse. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen, and he lived in luxury every day. Uh, some people know this, and not everyone does. You're about to find out. Why does it mention that he was dressed in purple? Well, if you read the Bible, clearly uh, purple is a color of royalty, it seems to be. Color is a purple of uh, expense. And uh, it turns out that a good-looking a good looking purple was hard to make back in the old days. So much so that it was very expensive to own anything in purple. Research shows that the way they were making the good purple dye for their cloth was to find a small sea, sea snail and remove a mucus gland from the sea snail, which would produce roughly a drop of purple dye. So you can imagine, it takes a lot of sea snails to dye one piece of clothing. And so those who were in the business, you know, it was, it was a niche market, you know, kind of like a Rolls Royce. Not everyone's got one, but those who can go out and get one or something similar. So that was the color purple. I mean, you got something purple. It showed you had some money. It was a status symbol. And this man was rich. He had purple. He had fine linens. He lived in luxury every day. And, of course, it contrasts against this beggar. A few things I wanted to mention. Uh, and that is in the contrast of being rich. Uh, not everyone who's rich is necessarily evil. And not everybody who's rich necessarily is doing a great job at being kind and nice and giving. Both are true. Uh, in fact, in the Bible, there's quite a few verses where uh, the Apostle Paul says, command those who are rich. He doesn't say command them who are rich to stop being rich. But he does say command those who are rich to be generous and willing to share. So he doesn't say being rich is evil, but what you do with it and how you got it can be evil. And I would say to some rich people, uh, uh, in, a, in a corporate situation, if I could pay every employee less than $1 less an hour than the average competitor, I just made a million dollars. And profit, you know. I mean, you could. Do, there could be a uh, uh, a motivation to be stingy or exacting or bare minimum, uh, especially we see in the olden days. It, before there was a lot of safety laws, companies didn't spend a whole lot on safety. You know, you lost a limb, you lost a limb. You could tell when people worked on the railroad because they kind of shook waved high like that. You know, uh, and mining and other things. So not, I want to say both, not everyone who's rich is necessarily evil, uh, not everyone who's rich is necessarily going to have an easy time getting into heaven. Uh, easier to pass through the eye of a camel, to pass through the eye of a needle, Jesus said, than a rich man to get into heaven. So some thoughts on modern day wealth. I'd explain my point on, on as we talk about rich people. Uh, using stock option realization measure, the CEO to co-worker compensation ratio 
was 20 to 1 in 1965. So the average CEO made 20 times the wage of the average worker. 20 times. Now let's say you got paid okay. You got enough to get yourself a little car, got you enough to get a little house. That means the head boss could have 20 of each of those things. I mean, or, you know, one house 20 times the size, I guess. You know, it was 20 to 1 ratio. That's good money, you know. In fact, he could buy one super big house and then maybe buy 10 small houses, you know. And you know, now he's got income from 10 houses. And, and, of course, the rich get richer. But it goes on to say it peaked at 368 to 1 in the year 2000. The average wage of an executive CEO was 368 times that of the average worker. It goes on to say that in 2018, it was down into around uh, 278 to 1 and 288 to 1, respectively, in 2017. So even now, as recently as 2018, according to this study, 278 to 1 was the ratio between a corporate and yeah, for your one house, they can buy 278. Or your one apartment, they could buy complexes, you know, with 278 apartments to one. Uh, but still, it said, though it's come down a little bit, still higher than at any point in the 60s, 70s, 80s, or 90s. It looks like corporate greed is getting greedier, according to this study. Uh, and then I went on to say the average wage earner around the world makes roughly 1500 a month, which by our standards isn't really that great, 18000 a year. Um, some people would think it's quite high because that's about $75 a day for 20-plus days of work a month. Uh, it's well known, though, that a third of all the world's population lives on less than $2 a day. It went on to explain why are those numbers so skewed well, part of the reason is because the corporate executives are so high on the way, or, you know, it spikes the numbers higher that the, you break it out into averages, the average is higher. But it's not going across the board. So, again, the fact that the Bible uh, does uh, focus on being rich and rich people, and, and uh, I read the statistics, I, I don't think anything's changed. I don't think there's anything, you know, should you consider yourself rich, be on guard. Be on guard that the money doesn't stop you from following God. That's all. It's not saying don't be rich. It's not saying don't use your money wisely. But it is saying don't get sidetracked. Well, you have this rich man. And then it says, at, was the rest of the first verse here, at his gate was, a, was laid a beggar named Lazarus covered with sores. He was laid out there covered with sores. And then look at verse 21. And longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table, even the dogs came and licked his sores. Here is this beggar, some might call him, you know, a, a bum uh, in our today's language. And he's outside this man's house hoping to eat scraps of the fit for the dog, hoping to eat that, and dogs are looking at his wounds. I have to do a little sidestep here. We're talking about uh, beggars. We're talking about people who ask for money. And on this, uh, even the dogs came and licked his sores. And that made me think of some things. One, not all beggars are created equal. Not all beggars are created equal. There is a kind that comes to this church. I had a call recently uh, last week, and a man came to the door a few days ago looking for money, gas, whatever. He didn't want any food because he already got that at another church, oddly enough. Uh, this particular gentleman owns a vehicle, has a phone, um, and he's been by here oh, once, twice a year for five years. He's doing okay. And my guess is if we don't help him, he has a regular route he runs. Apparently he goes to other churches and he gets by and he says he has a job, just doesn't pay as much as he'd like. And I'm seeing him all the time. This goes back to my first year going to church, 1990, I'm in Silver Springs, Nevada. And a man came in wanting some help. And I remembered him because he was taller than me. Now, if you're 6'3", six, 6'4", six, I usually don't have to look up to talk to you, you know. But if you start hitting 6'6", six, six, I actually have to crank my neck up. And while that's common for many of you, Stan, um, it's not common for me. 
right? It's not common for me to look up to talk to someone. And I remember the guy because I had to look up to talk to him. Would you be surprised if I told you a few years later, I saw him again. He was going through the churches in Fernley. And a few years later, I saw him again. And he was going through the churches in Fernley. And I think some people, some beggars, I'm trying to make a difference between two different kinds here, um, have some means of support or they have, that is their job. Begging is their job. And my guess is some nights they have good nights with a full meal and a motel stay and some nights didn't work out so good. But they keep it as their employment, as their focus, and they just do that. So much so, we had a couple who came to church, and they sat right over there. Uh, they were staying at a local motel, oddly enough, for those who might be staying at the exact same one. And they would come here, and during the daytime, they would take a taxi to one of two local begging spots, the Pilot on one exit, or Walmart. And they would beg all day till they had enough money pay for their motel, get a bite to eat. I know they came to church about three weeks. They did that steadily for three weeks before they moved on to the next town, the next area, the next whatever. So that's one kind of beggar. Now, if, how can I say this? Should you want to be a little hard-hearted and not help a beggar? Some of those people I agree with. Really, I'm not helping them. I'm helping them have a good night. They're not going to stop doing what they're doing. They never get to where they wanted to go. The story is always the same. If we can get the help, if we can get the money, we can make it to this location or that location. And that's where the family is. And that's where the tools are, where the job is, or where the you know, child care help is for our children. You know, It's always a good story that they have to get from point A to point B. It's also always wrong because they keep coming back around again. They never get to point A or point B. So should you want to be a little more calloused, hard-hearted, and not help every beggar you meet? I agree with you. I agree with you. But in the Bible, it says you should help people who are, who are down and out. It also says if you don't work, you don't eat. Now, I think of some Christians quote one and not the other one when the answer is both. There are situations where if they look like them I and they can drive a car, work a phone, you know, chances are they might be able to get a job. Especially if they got that much time to hit up every church in town. They got legs at work and they can read maps. I mean, they might have enough skills to hold down a job. You know? Uh, in the same token, there's the other type of beggar. In this particular case, one who was laid there, which may imply he couldn't even walk, full of sores. Now, this made me think of all those years I worked downtown in the alleys. The, the average beggar that comes to this church was far different than some of the beggars I met in downtown Reno. Some of them were full of sores and who knows what kind of diseases. Some of them were clearly mentally disturbed. They didn't have a car. They didn't have a thing. They were talking to people next to them who weren't really there. And if you want to have a compassion on a person like that, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Even if you're not sure what they're going to do with the money, the guy is not all there. Maybe not his fault. There's been you know, there's medical conditions that cause such things. There's accidents, head traumas. You could you know there's birthing problems with the cord wrapped around the neck for so long could cause strangulation and uh, they could get kicked in the head by a horse, fall out of a truck. And back in the old days, we rode in the back of trucks without seatbelts. You know we did. All these things could happen. These people could be seriously mentally uh, hindered and not necessarily their fault. So by all means, there's nothing wrong with helping people. Nothing at all. If you're not sure which way to go, I would say side on the side of grace, you know, until you see the same guy two, three times, you know, then maybe, okay, time to cut you off, bro. But, uh, and I've had to tell people that, and I could wholeheartedly tell them feeling I wasn't uh, letting Jesus down or God or Christianity. And we help people too. I want to bring that up because here's this beggar at the door covered in sores. Some of the guys downtown I mean, there's people who smell like B.O. who haven't been around a laundry in a while. You know what I'm talking about. No, I'm kidding. But actually, no, sometimes over here somewhere. So, uh, but these people had an incredible odor. It wasn't body odor. It was a, some sort of medical condition or what, which then there are medical conditions that the chemistry body gets off right and people just don't smell so good. What's that going to do for your social interaction? You know? Uh, how are you going to get out of that alley ever? Who's going to hire you? Who's going to put you in a car and try to get you cleaned up? No one. So 
you want to be kind and compassionate to the down and out, I'm all for it. I'm all for it. This clearly reminds me of the type of person who could use some help. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. Verse 22. Verse 22. Then time came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. So some time's gone on. Both have passed away. Jesus continues the story. Verse 23. In Hades. So the rich man was also died and was buried. In Hades, verse 23, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus at his side. So you got the rich man dies, the beggar Lazarus dies, and he goes off to Abraham's bosom. Abraham was the father of the, you know, the patriarch of the Israel Jewish race. And here he is in some sort of fashion. He's alongside of him in this afterlife and what comes next. Some people try to use this as a complete map of what looks next. I wouldn't do that because there's other passages you have to consider too. Some of the book of Revelations talk about a throne room and a this and a that. I wouldn't leave that out just because this particular passage doesn't mention that. And vice versa. I wouldn't include only that because it's... Uh, I don't think that's the point Jesus is trying to make. It's what heaven looks like. I don't think he's trying to explain that. I think he's trying to explain the difference between how you live your life in God's eyes. Because in our eyes, we'd have to say, man, that guy's got good-looking clothes. He's got a good-looking house. You know, he's got good-looking cars or chariots or whatever else was going on. You know, a fleet of horses or whatever. And the other guy, he ain't looking so good. That's what we would say just walking down the street, generally speaking. God looks at it differently. He looks at the heart. We talked about that before. It doesn't explain exactly what all the rich man did wrong. I don't want to add sins to him that I don't have written down here. Clearly, he didn't end up in a good place, so he wasn't doing something right. Following the wrong God, maybe wealth, maybe a false God, I don't know. But he wasn't doing something right. And based on our statistics we read, he might have gone the way of the average rich person, which is more for me, less for everybody else. And then he's in Hades, and he was in torment, it says, verse 23. And he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So even though he's in torment and in pain, off in the distance he can see this other scene. Of that beggar who used to lay out in the street with the sores on him, you know. And he's up there alongside of Abraham. So, verse 24. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. So we know that what the cause of the agony was, fire, torment, it says. Uh, there are those stereotypical preacher passages which was, you know, pound on the pulpit and fire and brimstone and you know, just hellfire's coming after you as you miss church three times in a row. And uh, I'm not trying to be that guy. I am going to say hell is mentioned. Hell is clearly mentioned, and based on what Jesus just said, pain and fire. Some people try to use, there's, a, there's another word that's sometimes used where there'll be an outer darkness with weeping and gnashing of teeth. That, that phrase is also used in the Bible. Some try to use that one and leave this one out as being metaphorical. Or Jesus is trying to explain that it's going to be so lonely you're going to feel like you're being burned. Well, I don't usually, I would put uh, a rainy day can feel lonely. You know, a sunburn never feels lonely. You know what I mean? I don't think how lonely I am when I have a sunburn. So I don't think it's quite as metaphorical as some people might have it, uh, allegorical or something, as some people would say. It sounds like it's not a fun place to be, very clearly. And so he hopes that he could take the tip of his finger in water and cool his tongue, which is a drop from a bum uh, finger. What kind of torment is that? Well, water dripping off a bum's finger looks tasty. Because I'm agony in this fire. But there's a problem, uh, verse 25. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Well, there is the good news and the bad news. 
The good news is that when life doesn't go so well and things are bad and you've had some rough stuff and uh, everyone in this room, and this is generally a small amount of people. Uh, in fact, I often if we're over 30 people, you know what I call it? A, a mega church. That's what I usually refer to it as if we have more than 30 people here. But in that 30 people, over time, we've known that there's people who've lost their child before time. They've had a family maybe uh, die in a car accident, you know, or a plane or something. There have been people here who know what it's like to find out, you know, they have an incurable disease at the ripe young age in their 20s. There have been people here who've gone home and never came back again due to suicide. Life affects all of us. It can affect you badly. I get that. But you know what this is saying? Is that this guy had it worse and bad, and guess what? He is being comforted. He's at the side of Abraham. That's the good news. That even when life gets rough and bad, and you've had some bad breaks, and you've made some, you, there's a chance, and a, a good chance through Christ, a great chance through Christ, that you will be up there in heaven um, at peace, it says, in comfort. The bad news it's not looking so good for Lazarus. Not looking so good for Lazarus. And by uh, all standards, and again, a third of the world makes $2 an hour. Even the poorest person here may be rich. The poorest person in this room may be rich compared to at least a third of the globe. In fact, the last report I saw said if you made over 100000 or something like that, uh, which currently I don't, but uh, if you did, that puts you in the top... I think 8% in the world. Right? That's, two, that's a dual income with, a, with you know, two people income with some decent jobs. Not even fantastic jobs. Many people can make $100,000 a year, a two-person two income, and some decent jobs. So the 8%, something like that, right? uh, it's going to have a hard time explaining how you weren't rich. I know that sounds difficult, but when we're talking about rich is just a matter of opinion. I mean, if all of us made a hundred thousand in the, in the room, uh, making a hundred thousand wouldn't be that impressive, you know. But if one person made two hundred thousand in the room, they'd have twice as much resources as the rest of us. They'd be quite well off, you know. It's a matter of perspective, right? Well, if we use the world as perspective, uh, you're rich, and what are you doing with your money? Now, this is where it gets different than a TV preacher. I'm not saying you need to send it in and get blessed by this church or me. I am saying you need to use it for God's glory. You need to not be selfish or stingy. Uh, and that could mean uh, giving away a dollar or two to the next down and out guy you see. And most of us, even the most lowest income in the room, which might be me, I think, uh, the most lowest income besides someone who's not working at all, uh, I could still lose a dollar or two and not lose sleep over it. You know what I mean? If I, if I got home at night and I was missing a buck or two from an earlier purchase, it, it'd be a bummer. You know, it dropped out, it fell out. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't lose sleep over it. I could, even at my, my minimal income, I could give away a dollar or two if I had to. And I think we need to get that from this story uh, of this rich and poor uh, positioning. He had his good things, you had his bad things. But then there's another problem, but just besides the way you lived your life and the way his life was lived. And that's verse 26. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. So it's interesting. They can see each other from afar. He can see the good taking place, and the torment taking place in this story, but you can't get between the two points. There's this great chasm, some sort of a border that allows you to see each other. So maybe a, the idea of two mountaintops and a vast valley, you know, you can see it, but you can't get there. Some type of image like that. And you can't go to them, and they can't come to us. You can't fix it. The pieces have been placed, in, the positions have been placed, they're permanent, and you can't fix it and I, I thought and I think about that and I think that might be the greatest punishment of all not the torment of the fire but be able to see what could have been that could be the greatest torment you face in the afterlife 
knowing it could have been different, knowing you should have listened, knowing that there was another way to go and you didn't do it. And I think in this life, we can, we'll can we definitely have some of those wish I should have, could have. That's kind of normal in life. You know, you could have thought about investing into some unknown company named Google and chose not to, or Tesla or some of those other ones, and found out later on that maybe you should have invested them. And there's every time they pop up in the news with new stock dividends or something and, you know, creating the third richest, second richest person in the world. Yeah, man, you have to look back and remember, maybe I should have invested in that. But we're talking about one of the most important things in this life is where we're going next. It's a destination. And I've talked about these things before, but I'll talk them again briefly. When you choose to take a trip, you plan accordingly. The further the trip, the greater it is, I think you plan even better. For instance, if I'm running down the street, I don't think about it too much. I throw my keys in my pocket and hope I brought my wallet, right? I don't bring a change of clothes. I don't bring a, necessarily a hat or sunglasses or sunscreen. I don't bring anything. I'm just heading down the street. But a little bit further, maybe I'm going to be spending all day in town shopping. You know, Reno being uh, 30 miles away. If there's anyone online who doesn't know the location. Well, if I'm going to be in town 30 miles away, I may bring a bit more. I'll definitely throw a couple Diet Cokes in a cooler, as is my custom. I will uh, probably bring maybe a jacket or something like that. Because, right, I'm going to be gone longer and the time's longer. We are planning a trip to Texas. We're going to be loading up all sorts of stuff. Why, someone's hair care products, not necessarily my own, can take up an entire suitcase. Can take up an entire suitcase. And you plan accordingly. You're going to be gone longer. We're talking about what comes after, after this life. And people don't seem to plan at all. In fact, if I was going to plan, I would probably do a, uh, at least get a feel for it, at least logically and in some sort of intellectual honesty, I should at least check out some of the religions who talk about an afterlife. Not all do. Not all religions are equal. Not all talk about an afterlife. But some do, and I would check out some of those. But if one of them had a guy who died and came back, that would rise high to the list of the first ones I check out. Someone who's been dead and came back. Someone who says they come from heaven and going back to heaven. That would be a guy I think I'd start listening to. He might have more accurate information than any other guest out there. Because nobody else has been out there and done those things. His name is the Lord Jesus Christ. And you should follow him just for that reason. If not all the other miracles and wonderful things he said and did. So then in verse 27, he has a new plan, this rich man. Verse 27, he answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family. Verse 28, For I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Well, whatever, however bad this guy was, I think it's, let's give him a bone here. It's kind of nice he's looking out for his brothers. Right? And that actually kind of struck me odd because I know the more money gets involved, the further brothers and sisters can grow apart. Uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, watch an inheritance come down the pike sometime and see the separation between brothers and sisters. But here he's actually worried about his brothers. So uh, let, let him, you know, he says, let him warn him. Send Lazarus. Uh, send a beggar. He's, you know, he's a so apparently, from his view, I'm just guessing here, looks like he's able to look around. Maybe Lazarus is moving now, moving under his own power, you know? And he's, he'll be able to go tell my brothers. Just a guess. <clears throat> Let him warn them, verse 28, so they will not also come to this place of torment. Verse 29, Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. When he says Moses and the prophets, he's not talking about they're actually walking around right there. That's Jewish history, Moses and the prophets. He's talking about what they said, the written word, what we would call the Old Testament. That is the uh, Moses the first five books of the Bible that were written by Moses, the Pentateuch, the Law of Moses, the books of Moses, and the prophets is mostly the, next, the whole second half of your Old Testament. He's saying you have that. That's all they need. And you know he's right. Even without the New Testament, 
if you read through the Old Testament and you have an open mind, you start seeing these verses about a Messiah is going to come. He's going to come. There's going to be this person who's going to be born in Bethlehem. There's going to be this person who, <coughs> excuse me, uh, seems to die like on a cross, Psalms 22. Psalms 22 written a thousand years before Christ. Sounds like a guy dying on a cross if you read it. So you start putting together this piece that something's going to happen here. And then when you do hear the story of Jesus, well, it fills it completely. It works out really well. It makes perfect sense. The fulfillment of the scriptures. And again, I think, I think the Bible is impressive on minor terms in that it's geographically correct and historically correct. Now, I don't think those make you automatically believe it, but those actually put it a quantum leap over many a religious book. There are religious books in play today in different denomination type religious groups, uh, other, other religions, that really don't have any factual base in history. You can't find the places they're talking about on a map. You can't find the kings and queens and people groups they're talking about in any history book. It almost sounds like it was made up. You know, much like Narnia or Middle Earth. You could be a complete atheist right now. But if you're even remotely intellectually honest, you'd have to admit there is a Jerusalem. Find it on the map. You hear about it in the news from time to time still. There is a Damascus. There is a Nile. There is an Egypt. You know, those places are still there. So just by itself, that's impressive. But that's not the, that's not the winner. That's not the winner. But it's, it's historically correct as far as the history goes. You know, the Assyrians were running around and then the Babylonians came along sometimes later and that's the way world history plays out. There's not too much of an argument over that. Eventually the Romans, during Jesus' time, the Romans were running around. Nobody has a problem believing that. You know, they'd taken over most of Europe and around the Mediterranean and even worked their way halfway through England, uh, the Roman Empire did. So no reason to believe, so it's historically correct, it's geographically correct, like I said, Jerusalem, Damascus. So those are good things, but those aren't the winners. The prophecy, the prophecy being fulfilled. How did they write these things down before the guy was born and they fit him like a description? You know, like they're reading his, his address on his mail, his name, his zip code, his address. There's only one guy that's going to fit that, you know. By the time you put all that information on an envelope, you've narrowed a person down from everybody in the world. Because of the location and the city and the street and the address and the name and the zip code. You've just singled that person out from everybody in the world. That's what the prophecies in the Old Testament do. There's only one person that fits all that, Jesus Christ. That should motivate you to keep reading, if nothing else. And then uh, there's also uh, a middle point, And that is there's just some truth being spoken in there when you read through the Old Testament and the New there's just some truth being spoken. It's truth that doesn't change. Uh, scientific facts change as we understand more about science. Medical information changes as we learn about more about medicine. I mentioned this just last week or whatever that uh, I'd much rather go to a doctor now than 100 years ago or 200 years ago. Why? Right? The difference is between getting some antibiotics or just getting some leeches. You know? The difference between them testing my blood or just letting some more out. Right? That is the difference from medicine now and just a few hundred years ago. It changes. When I read through the Old Testament, the New Testament, it talks about human nature. It talks about the way man thinks in his heart and how he goes this way and that way. It hasn't changed. It's still eternally true. Furthermore, it doesn't make a lot of claims that have you know, uh, proven to be false. Uh, there's a few things that people argue about. Uh, one is that Jesus said something about the sun rises and the sun sets. Well, we know the sun isn't moving, the earth is, mo the earth is rotating. And some people say, see, Jesus didn't understand the cosmos. Well, he didn't, neither did the weatherman, because he told me sunrise was going to be at 612 this morning or whatever it was. So uh, we still use the word sunrise, uh, even though we know that the sun, the earth is rotating. But again, there's a few verses people come to, but... Very little of it is, is odd or doesn't make any sense or just uh, superstition. So amazing thing, the Old Testament, and that is the point was just made. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. So he's just told them the truth. The old, you got to read your Bible, basically, is what he said. Now, the rich man acts like a typical person when talking to God or an angel or somebody of authority. Uh, verse 30. No, Father Abraham, he said. You're wrong, is what he's telling them. 
I don't want to do it that way. I want to do it my way, which may imply why he's where he's at. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. So even then, he's also admitting that he should have repented, but they will. No, he should have turned around. He should have lived his life differently, but they will if someone from the dead comes back. Verse 31. He said to them, he said to him, even if they do not listen to Moses and the if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Who's Jesus talking about there? Well, a shadow of him. He'll rise from the dead and people still won't believe. Something that any other would-be religious political leader has not ever done. To die and rise from the dead. And here is one who's done so. And even because of that, it says people may not believe. And I don't know what it takes sometimes for a person to believe. I don't know what they have to go through, what they think. And the difference in thought. I, sometimes I wish I knew what a person was thinking. You know, And sometimes you wouldn't want to know what a person's thinking. You know? Oh, here comes Fat Mike again. You know, something like that as they think out loud, right? But uh, it's not just what a person's thinking that, that, that makes me curious. Because I can't see their heart. I can't see why they're thinking that. We will make decisions based on fear. We can make decisions based on pride and arrogance. I know people who make decisions, horrible decisions, based on loneliness. Loneliness and depression can lead to all sorts of things. And those decisions made because of those things. I can't see people's hearts. I can tell you some of the most common excuses I've heard and how they're not going to work too well as to why they don't follow Christ. Some will say, I'd like to read the Bible, but it's too hard to understand. I agree that if you're trying to read a language that's 400 years old and you're not good on Shakespearean English, that could be hard to understand. The good news is, for hundreds of years, they keep making other translations and more modern English. Why, we got a whole slew of them. My phone has 26 English translations on it, I think, on one Bible app. 26, 25 English translations. Chances are you could find one uh, if you wanted to that you could possibly read. What if you can't read? You just never developed the skill. You have this, this the dyslexia or something. Well, you live in a great time now that I get you on any given Sunday, you could probably find some guy to help explain the Bible to you for free. You know, churches all over town. Wednesday nights too, for that matter. In fact, this particular Bible app, uh, you can hit the play button and it'll read it to you. It'll read it to you. You don't have to be able to read a single lick. You just have to be able to push play. And it'll start reading the Bible right to you. So that's not going to be a great excuse. The Bible says too hard to understand. Next is, of course, well, I thought about trying out Christianity and the Bible and stuff, but I went to a bad church. You know, I had a horrible experience at a church. Maybe shocked. I have too. I've had bad experiences at this church. I'm not making that up. Real bad experiences sometimes. Right? But the fact is, uh, that's not going to be a great excuse. Do you know why? Because I've had bad experiences everywhere else. I've had bad experiences at work. More than one job. Should I never work again? I've had bad experiences at fast food restaurants. I've been I've got the wrong meal given to me. I've been shortchanged. I think I've even had the wrong stuff and shortchanged once or twice over life. Right? I think everyone else is kind of smiling and chuckling. You know what I'm talking about. Would you come to the conclusion, I will never dine out again because I had a bad experience? No. How about the argument that there's too many religions, too many churches, too many options, too many choices, too many, uh, you know. Would you apply that logic to anything else? You know, I don't know where to buy gas. There's too many gas stations. Right? Well, that'd be foolish. Pick one. If you don't like it, pick another one. You know, you can, you can get gas if you have to. You, know, you wouldn't apply that logic to anything else. Why would you apply it to church? Oh, there's just too many banks. I don't know which one to put my money in, you know. There's too many stores. I just don't know where to buy groceries. Nobody would ever say these things. Then why would you say them about a church unless you're just using it for an excuse? I conclude today by saying Christ is Lord. He is risen from the dead and should be followed. And... Based on the story of Lazarus, don't be that guy, uh, rich man Lazarus, don't be the rich man. 
Don't follow that path. Spend some time. Again, just in Moses and the prophets, you can learn. Read your Bibles and seek Christ and try to understand what he said and what he did. And see if that doesn't change things, both here and now and there and then. Let us pray. Father above, Heavenly Father, I thank you again for this time and your word. Be it in Luke or Matthew, John, wherever we read, may the words fly off the page and affect our hearts and our minds. And we may be children who follow you and do not follow the world in its ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for visiting. Coming from home, you are dismissed.